Hey everyone, welcome to Inside Gaming. It's Sunday, and we are just two glorious weeks away from the return of our video game lord and savior. That's right, I'm talking about Isabel and her best friend, Doom Guy. I'm here with Caden, hey who's an Animal Crossing expert who's gonna learn me a little bit about Animal Crossing because I'm a noob, but it has been seven years since the last mainline Animal Crossing game, and 12 years since the last time it was on a home console. Uh, yes, before we continue, we do know that Happy Home Designer and Amiibo Festival came out in 2015 and that Pocket Camp came out in 2017, but a home building sim, a Mario Party with no mini games, and a mobile game hardly count as mainline titles. That's right, I wouldn't want those in my veins. No thank you, I only mainline the numbered Animal Crossing. So we figured it'd be a great time to see where this much beloved series started off and how it got to where it is now. So start up the inside gaming time machine because we're heading back to 2001 to start this bogus journey. <gasps> Anyways, uh, Caden, where do we begin on this journey? So it's pretty well documented that Animal Crossing began as a concept when the series creator Katsuya Iguchi originally started at Nintendo and moved from his hometown of Chiba to Nintendo's company headquarters in Kyoto. Iguchi cited his feelings of loneliness and isolation that spurred the initial idea for the series. Wow, you just said a lot of Japanese words. <laughs> so about this, Iguchi stated, quote, Animal Crossing features three themes, family, friendship, and community. But the reason I wanted to investigate them was a result of being so lonely when I arrived in Kyoto. When I moved there, I left my family and friends behind. In doing so, I realized that being close to them, being able to spend time with them, talk to them, play with them, was such a great and important feeling. I wondered for a long time if there would be a way to recreate that feeling, and that was the impetus behind the original Animal Crossing. Yeah, so as for the actual gameplay, that came from a desire to play games with the family he created once he moved. However, while his wife and kids would be playing games when he returned home, it'd soon be off to to bed, leaving him wondering how they could all still play games together. He summarized these thoughts in an interview with Gamasutra saying, My family plays games and would sometimes be playing when I got home, and I thought to myself, they're playing games, and I'm playing games, but we're not really doing it together. So, this was something that the kids could play after school, and I could play when I got home at night. And I could kind of be part of what they were doing while I wasn't around. And at the same time, they get to see things I've been doing. It was kind of a desire to create a space where my family and I could interact even more, even if we weren't playing together. Damn. Th roll the theme music from up, my heart's starting to swell. Anyways, Animal Crossing's accessibility and ease of play came from Iguchi's previous history in game development. Everything he'd made up to that point in his career was, you know, fast platformers or arcade-style games, and he'd begun to realize that for people his age, or those unfamiliar with gaming, they had an increasingly difficult time jumping into games like that. You know, right, Caden? Yeah. In that same Gamasutra interview, Iguchi said, quote, The games I made before Animal Crossing were always pretty tough to finish. And I was thinking as I got older, these games are just too hard. One thing I hope the industry moves towards is a gameplay style that's accessible to everyone. We don't want to have a situation where people who start from the beginning have a fine time and level up and all that, but people who try to join later are surrounded by these powerhouse players that just totally dominate everything. There's a barrier limiting people from playing then, so I'd like to see games that have no age, gender, or race barriers, really. I mean, you could just go camp in the woods like a real person, but nah, leave it up to them to, to simulate it. But we've already made a video about why that's fun. Anyways, in 1999, Nintendo was in the mood to get more than a bit experience experimental when it came to new titles, and this gave Iguchi the ability to explore the concept of what would become Animal Crossing for Nintendo's next big thing, the N64DD. So, if you don't know what that is, the DD was N64's answer to the growing popularity of CD-based games, and included features Nintendo had originally wanted for the base N64, including internet connectivity and an internal clock. Cartridges were becoming more expensive and had a much, much, much smaller memory cap, so Nintendo created the DD to use utilize a proprietary magnetic disc with an average size of 64 megabytes, and it was also cheaper to manufacture, but uh, that didn't really turn out super well for them, did it, Caden? Yeah, no, unfortunately those magnetic discs were about 10 times smaller than the average CD-ROM at the time, and still more expensive than CDs to actually manufacture. This, along with the development's cost of the DD itself, it sounded the death knell for the add-on early on in its life cycle. It only lasted from 1999 to 2001, with only 10 games released on it. Hmm, sounds like Stadia. Got him! Anyways, most projects that were 
planned for the N64 DD were either canceled outright, delayed to unspecific dates, or reworked entirely to fit on the traditional N64 carts. Games that were reworked included Pokemon Stadium, Paper Mario, Kirby 64, Ocarina of Time, Conker's Bad Fur Day, and, of course, Animal Crossing. And could you imagine if we didn't get those games on cart? God, that's like half of Nintendo's 64's good library. Anyways, despite the shift in release format in April of 2001, two months after the DD's discontinuation, Dobutsu no Mori, aka Animal Forest, was released for the N64 to satisfy Iguchi's original desires for an accessible game that could connect people with one another, no matter when they played the game. So, uh, uh, Caden, what's the whole shtick with Animal Forest? So, Animal Forest would use a slightly modified Nintendo 64 cart to implement the core feature of a real-time clock, and would utilize the expansion pack to increase the game's overall resolution from 320 by 240 to 640 by 480, which were obvious remnants of its past as a DD-developed title. But while Animal Forest was mostly the game Iguchi wanted it to be, it was hardly the game we know it as today. Mainstay characters like Tortimer, Captain Blathers, Blanca, Wisp, as well as the Able Sister Shop and the museum were missing from the title entirely, and the ability to create patterns weren't really included either. Then what the f**k's the point? I was gonna say, that's a lot of stuff to be missing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this all brings us to December of 2001 and the release of the greatly expanded Animal Forest Plus for the GameCube. Releasing only eight months after the original, this Plus version was the basis for everything we basically know about Animal Crossing in the West. Aside from the inclusion of the museum, Able Sisters Shop, and previously missing characters, Animal Forest Plus added in more playable NES titles, more house upgrades, expanded lists of catchable bugs and fish, and e-reader functionality. So this version was also what would be initially ported to other territories starting in 2002 under the title of, drum roll, Animal Crossing! Yay! We finally got there. Caden, please, what, what was next for this storied lineage? Okay, so Japan would get one more updated version of the Animal Forest titles as Animal Forest E+, that would further expand on the e-reader functionality, the ability to go to the island without the GBA connection, new villagers and islanders, and even more bugs and fish to collect. There Whoa! are so many bugs! I'm getting an entomological boner right now. These updated versions and worldwide releases help catapult Animal Crossing into popularity and a new entry in the series was announced at E3 2004 for Nintendo's newest handheld system, the Nintendo DS. Oh yes, the Nintendo dual screens. Yeah, this title originally called Animal Crossing DS was eventually released under the name Animal Crossing Wild World in the West and Animal Forest Come On Over in Japan and took full advantage of the unique hardware. The Come On Over aspect of the Japanese title is the core new mechanic for the DS entry of Animal Crossing. This would be the first in the series to utilize an on Online connection that allowed players to visit other villages without having to play on the same console. That was big news at the time, right, Caden? Heck yeah, but you know, there was friend codes, so oh. not as heck yeah. But you know, you could exchange those friend codes and it allowed other players worldwide to finally join in adventuring together and help beautify each other's towns. This is where some of the biggest and most notable features in the series came to be. Things like the greater character customization, slingshots, watering cans, golden tool variants, Celeste, Brewster, Harriet, getting portraits from your favorite villagers, flower crossbreeding, the Able Sister shop selling clothes, and so, 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 so much more. Wild World quickly became the definitive way to play Animal Crossing, selling nearly 12 million units, and was a much greater realization of Iguchi's original concept of connecting with other players than they, you know, weren't even around. But Iguchi wasn't done exploring the idea of a fully connected world that would live and breathe even when you were away. Another title in the Animal Crossing series was the concept phase at the same time as Wild World, intended for Nintendo's next home console. We're talking about the Wii. That's right, Caden, huh? Yep, Iguchi aimed for these two titles to connect, allowing players who spent years with Wild World to transfer everything to the new Animal Crossing game called City Folk and continue their adventures. City Folk, titled Animal Force Let's Go to Town in Japan, allowed players to move. When starting up the game, players would be prompted to either start a new character or move their existing Wild World character into the city. But you wouldn't be able to take everything with you, unfortunately. Things like items, bells, and, you know, your house upgrades, they wouldn't come along with you. Ugh. You hate it, but you know, sometimes that minimalist lifestyle pays off. So the idea for City Folk was to take the groundwork for global online play and further expand on it to make it the best way to play with friends. But unfortunately, while City Folk was in development in some form around the time of Wild World, the goals for the title were lofty and in a 2006 GDC interview with IGN, Iguchi stated that, nothing really down on paper yet. I'm actually in a team that's looking at the Wii outside of the controller, coming up with unique features of the system that has nothing to do with it. Unfortunately, 
unfortunately, I can't say what we've come up with yet. Even back in 2006, Yaguchi was stonewalling us, couldn't even give us that, that hot friend EA enough to let us know what was coming down the pipe. But it'd be an additional two years after that interview before we'd finally see City Folk hit store shelves. Isn't that right? Yep, but true to his word, Iguchi delivered on expanded Wi-Fi capabilities in City Folk, and it allowed players to communicate with their friends via letters, receive special gifts from Nintendo via the Wi-Fi, and utilize everybody's favorite feature of the Wii, Wii Speak peripheral, to allow players to voice chat. And it would have Blanca traveling through the internet, visiting towns, and encouraging players to connect with one another through both local and global connectivity. In addition to this beefed up online connection, City Folk also added back in holidays, like Halloween and Christmas, which were removed from Wild World for the ease of localization. Unfortunately, City Folk didn't sell as well as its predecessor, selling just under 5 million units worldwide, so it was back to the drawing board to find a way to recapture what made the series such a success on the DS. So it'd be a long four years before we saw a new Animal Crossing game, 2011 in Japan and 2012, well, everywhere else. But this new title would be just what the series needed to reclaim its throne as the global phenomenon and take full advantage of Nintendo's 3DS console Baby, what am I talking about, Caden? You're talking about Animal Crossing New Leaf. Damn straight I am! Or Animal Force Jump Out in Japan, which is a much less interesting title, if I'm to be honest. But this would mark the directorial debut of Aya Kyogoku, Nintendo Entertainment Analysis and Development's first female director. Kyogoku's theory to revive the series was simple. Go back to the basics. Mm, yeah, Kyogoku stated that with Animal Crossing City Folk, it was clear that the series had challenges that we needed to overcome, and that for this new title, they would need to refine what players found enjoyment in and kept them coming back for long stretches of time. The inspiration and additions for what would be Animal Crossing New Leaf came from Kyogoku's history in the video game industry. She said, When I was starting in the game industry, it wasn't uncommon to be the only woman on the entire team. I always felt welcome and I never felt awkward. In my years at Nintendo, I've come to discover that when there are women in a variety of roles on the project, you get a wider range of ideas. Funny how that works, huh? So when you're trying to create something that will appeal to many types of people, I have experienced how beneficial it is to have diversity on your team. Again, crazy how that works. Her team alongside co-director Isao Moro and series producer Katsuya Iguchi took this as a challenge to bring to life the Animal Crossing game that would serve as the best entry point for new players and bring back those players who had kind of, you know, just glazed over city folk. So Caden, what was this uh, next game about? The core concept this time would have a focus on giving the player more control over their town and greatly expand every other existing feature in the series thus far. Originally, the development team had no planned reason for this player's new ability to change the town at will until a year into the game's development when the idea of being the mayor had come up. Kyogoku explained how this came to be during an Awada Asks interview, saying, quote, For about the first year, Katsuya Uguchi-san, Nogami-san, Moro-san, and I were talking in a small group, and we were worried that if we said, you can place all kinds of things around the town in the new Animal Crossing game, then players would simply take that as being a single element of the game and not see it as a big deal. Then, during the process, we were preparing to make a presentation for Shigeru Miyamoto-san and Takashi Tezuka-san, and we started to wonder how we could possibly sum up the idea behind the new Animal Animal Crossing in a single keyword or concept. Hell yeah. Good 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 job on that uh that read, Caden son. Domo. Domo <laughs> some pie. <laughs> If you're familiar with Nintendo's development history, the idea of summarizing your entire game's concept in a simple phrase is a key selling point on getting that game into full production. And with the player becomes the mayor set as their goal, New Leaf would be moving full ahead in development. Upon release, New Leaf was universally praised by critics and gamers alike and sold nearly 13 million units worldwide. Woo, that's a lot of animals crossing, making it the current best-selling game in franchise history. So, what about all those changes and additions, though, you might be asking? We just got Isabel. We, Isabel, that's all we got. That's all we really needed. All hail Isabel. Oh, finally, God. It took us long to get here, but we're here now and we ain't leaving. And of course, we got to explore the core concept of a fully customizable town for the first time. Not only would players get to choose between various preset towns to move into, they'd be able to pick the locations for new buildings, features, and various public works projects as the game progressed. Police stations, campsites, the roost. <laughs> Retail, kicks shoe store, gardening store, club, LOL, the happy home showcase, dream suite, the return of the island, and so much more made this the most expansive and alive title yet. Isn't that right? To fill in all these new locations, the total of villagers hit a record high of 335, including new species like deer and hamsters and new personalities for villagers as well. Yeah, you'd also have more control over who moves into or out of your town. Villagers could visit in an RV and be invited to stay, and those that moved out could still be seen 
frequenting the shops in the game's Main Street area, which is nice. As somebody who moved like eight times in my childhood, I got really good at making friends and never seeing them again. So. Wow, depressing. So many answering machines full of messages saying goodbye. Of course, what would an Animal Crossing game be without collectibles? Nothing. That's what, New Leaf had a total of 72 varieties of bugs and fish in the game to catch, and also added the ability to dive deep for certain things by swimming in the ocean and grabbing creatures with their hands or their paws or little Little nasty mitts. Character customization was also beefed up as well. And that's not even including its major Welcome Amiibo update from 2016, huh, Caden? Nope, that's not all. Welcome Amiibo added in the ability to bring villagers in directly using Amiibo cards. You remember those? You remember all those Amiibo cards that cost $11 a pack for six? It made it easier to have your perfect village and remove those unwanted neighbors. And an additional 50 new villagers were added to the game. On top of all that, Splatoon items were added to the game via the Amiibo function as well and two new characters, Cece and Vici, which were, you know, the Animal Crossing versions of Splatoon's Callie and Marie characters. But Splatoon wasn't the only series to get some unique villagers. Zelda and Monster Hunter both had various unique villagers that would visit depending on which amiibo were scanned. Yeah, you could also use the new function called the amiibo camera and place villagers into real life photos, similar to the AR functionality in Pokemon Go. And so that leads us to this year's Animal Crossing New Horizons. Finally, now under the Soul Direct directorial control of Ayaki Ogoku with Hisashi Nogami taking over producer duties for Katsuya Iguchi, New Horizons seems to be aiming to up the ante on just how customizable Animal Crossing can be, isn't that right? Yeah, we haven't yet personally experienced just how big these changes are in New Horizons, but we're pretty excited to find out just how unique we can make our islands. In the end, we were given one of the chillest and most unique video game experiences of all time, simply because of one man's desire to reconnect with his hometown, his family, and jump back into playing video games, and one woman Woman's aim to create a game so customizable that anyone around the world would be able to enjoy it. Mm, now, if only Nintendo would let us play as custom animal villagers instead of humans, then it'd be a truly perfect game. What's the deal with there being animals and people? Is it like Bojack, where it's just like nobody blinks at it? It's just like, what happens? Yeah, I think so. Or you just come from a different land where people exist and you jump in and they're just like, I guess there's animals here. And they're just wandering around. It's totally normal. They never really explained it. Like even in, in the first Animal Crossing, you just end up on a train to a town full of animals. Yeah, you talk to Rover, Rover laughs at your name and then shoves you out the door and says, go live here, bitch. Yeah. Huh? Makes, I, if Allison Bree can f golden retriever, then anything's possible. Guess what, everybody? Animal Crossing New Horizons looks sick as hell and we're too excited to come up with a good joke here. Yeah, bing, 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 bing. We did it. You know we had to bring the homegirl auto mode for this one. <laughs> I insisted. I took out both of my knives and I went. <laughs> so we get accused of being too negative sometimes. No, we don't. 